Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Local Government and Resettlement, Tips for Working Together for Refugee Welcome. Uh, this webinar is made possible today by the support of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, so very thankful for that. Uh, Susan downs Carcos. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Welcoming America, and it's really my pleasure to serve as your moderator today on this important webinar and to have such wonderful speakers lined up to share with you their experiences and collaboration. Uh, today's webinar on local government and refugee resettlement collaboration really couldn't be coming at a more important time. Things seen after the recent tragic events, uh, including Paris, um, we've seen local governments, resettlement organizations, and a host of other community actors overcome a, an extremely difficult environment in which emotions, politics, and discourse have been rocky at times. And many of you have come together to coordinate efforts to help alleviate fears and misunderstanding of the resettlement process and to show a message of welcome in our communities. Uh, I really want to note how um, impressed and inspired all of us at Welcoming America have been by the outpouring of support for our new neighbors and the ways in which so many have stood up for the many contributions that refugees make every day in our communities. So thank you, and thank you for joining us today. Um, as we celebrate this unprecedented collaboration, we're really pleased to be able to hear from two communities um, that figured out how to make the most of local government government CBO collaboration. Not only share with you some of the innovative projects they're working on together, but you'll also learn their recipe for success. So today we'll first be hearing um, from uh, our, our friends in the city of Seattle, uh, Alia Gupta, who is the interim director at the city of Seattle's Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs. Alexander Olins, who directs the Employment and Citizenship Program for the Asian Counseling and Referral Service. After we hear from um, Seattle, we'll then turn to the east and we'll hear from the City of Columbus. We're joined today by Guadalupe Velasquez, who's the Assistant um, Director at the City of Columbus, and Nadia Kasvin, who uh, is the co-founder of U.S. Together in Columbus. Um, you've got these two uh, examples of collaboration to, to think about a bit. We'll open it up for your questions and comments. Uh, we hope to have um, a rich online discussion and would encourage you to chin your questions and comments uh, for the conversation that will follow our speakers. Um, that's a little bit about our agenda today. We have about an hour planned, and we're looking forward to digging in on this a very important conversation. And to get it started, we'll um, first hear from Alia Gupta with the City of Seattle. And um, thank you so much for joining us, Alia. There we go. I'm unmuted now. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Greetings from Seattle. It's a very wet and rainy day here. Nothing unusual, I guess, for Seattle. <laughs> um, yes, as Susan mentioned, the last few weeks have been quite challenging. But Washington is fortunate to have a governor, Governor Inslee, who has shown great strength and leadership. He's the first governor to release a statement uh, that Washington is a welcoming state. And Mayor Ed Murray followed after that with a statement in support as well. Ours, in the meantime, has been trying to be really proactive, sending out positive messaging right from the start, using both mainstream and ethnic media. Uh, letting our immigrant refugee communities know that the city is there, substanding with them, and letting our mainstream community know that we are indeed a welcoming city. Well, let's start with a quick overview of Seattle. Um, Seattle demographics have changed significantly in the last 15 years. We now have close to a fifth of our city uh, who, is, who are foreign-born. We have over 129 languages spoken in our schools. Uh, this is unusual from other metropolitan cities in that we don't necessarily have big blocks of languages, language, large language groups, but we have many smaller language groups. So where most cities have top three to five languages, we actually think of ourselves as having top 10 to 
15 languages. Um, the Immigrant Refugee Affairs is a fairly new office. It was established in 2012. And our mission is very simple, to improve immigrant and refugee lives in tangible and practical ways. Our centered around immigrant integration, using an equity framework to ensure that our communities have a voice and city program services meet community needs. So one of the things that we believe is really important in our work. So I just want to step back a second and say Seattle is really lucky. We have a really vibrant array of community-based organizations and strong leaders in our immigrant refugee communities that make our work possible. And one of the things we've learned is that it's really important to listen and then to act. So art is very deeply connected to our communities, and we play, pay close attention to what the issues are. When there are public processes taking place at City Hall, budget hearings, town halls, focus groups, we get the word out to our communities using outreach and ethnic media so that our communities can engage in these processes. And we see ourselves as being a key player at policy tables in the city, having education, workforce, labor standards, and a host of other issues. So we're able to use the immigrant refugee lens to inform policy making. This is really important for municipal governments, and I think that the, we can't emphasize the importance of being at policy tables representing immigrant and community needs. <clears throat> The City of Seattle actually has been really good about thinking outside the box, trying to find creative solutions to challenges that are occurring in our communities. Um, an example is our pilot and Islamic financing for housing purchases. Recently, um, the mayor had convened a housing and affordability committee to develop recommendations for Seattle, and they came up with 60 recommendations. Office discussed immigrant and refugee housing needs with the city's policy team as these recommendations were being developed. As a result, the issue of Muslim home ownership was brought to the table. This now exploring financial products that are Sharia compliant and can be used by Muslim residents to purchase homes. So that's just a, a way that we can think outside the box and be creative about um, finding solutions to, to uh, community needs. Another example is our work with the Seattle Police Department and refugee women. The conversations process in 2012, we heard really clearly that fear and mistrust of the police was a major issue for refugee communities. They didn't know who to call, they didn't know how to call, they were afraid to call. So as a result, we partnered with the police department to design an institute where 20 refugee women and 20 female officers spent two Saturdays together learning about each other. It was quite an amazing event. I was there for several of the sessions, and it was great to see the strong relationships that developed between the refugee participants and the police officers. And so really what it boiled down to was there was relationship building happened that increased trust. And as a result, refugee women emerged with greater trust in the police and confidence in their ability to ask for help. This was key. And while this institute was going on, we realized that the refugee participants also didn't know how to access city programs and services. So we actually added to our curriculum components where they could, um, where we had service providers and, and city partners coming in and talking about their services, housing and education, after school, things like that that were relevant for them. And, and really trains them how to go out and act, actually access these services. On the other side, the female police officers developed a much deeper understanding and empathy for the challenges our refugee communities face on a day-to-day -day level. And so, and uh, several police officers afterwards came up and told me how, how this has really changed how the way they're doing community policing. They are much more with refugee communities that understand now the importance of which access, of using interpreters, and of translating materials. And the Seattle Police Department has actually started up an internship program where they have interns coming in and developing language access protocols for them. 
So it's been a really great um, result from this institute, and now we are doing a second iteration, which is uh, family-focused, and we're calling it the Immigrant Family Institute, that will launch in, uh, later in 2016. <clears throat> Um, we, we have very strong collaborations with our community partners. We see ourselves as more than just funders. We see ourselves as active partners in the work, leverage city resources and connections, and cleaning stakeholders from across sectors. And one partner is here with us today, Alex Owens from ADRS, and she's going to talk to you about um, a project that we're working together on called Ready to Work, uh, which is a pilot project that was developed by our office. Alex? Thanks. Um, so uh, Asian Counseling and Referral Service is the primary community-based organization partner on the Ready to Work program. Ready to Work is a workforce program wrapped around intensive uh, an, an intensive ESL and digital literacy class for people at the lowest, who speak English at the lowest level. So historically there was a sense among advocates that more and more people who were coming for employment services in the city of Seattle, we're coming at CASAS levels one through three, and that more and more of the programming and funding city and statewide was going towards levels four and five in terms of getting people on a, um, into community college classes that would lead them cert to certificates, which is great and very important, but if you're a level one or two or three, a certificate program at a community college is really quite a distance away. So we wanted to develop something that would be um, a response to people's need to get a job right away and to focus on a longer-term plan for a career. So that's what Ready to Work is. So it's contextualized ESL, all for work, ESL for work. Everything that we do is geared around um, employment uh, prospects. So if, if we're exploring the past tense, we're talking about what did you do, what work have you had, what did you do in your native country. If we're talking about the, the, the future tense, we're talking about what will you do, what can you do. Uh, so everything is embedded in that, that environment of work. So, and we have holistic case management, um, and I'll go into a little bit of what we do that's, that I think is, is quite special. So we've had two classes so far ready to work over the summer and in the fall. Um, and we'll, we've had, we're going to two more classes is in the quarter. So, so what do we do in Ready to Work that's different and special? So intensive ESL, what is intensive ESL? 12 hours a week, small group, two, small classes with two tutors. Uh, language acquisition really has to be time intensive if you're going to see the level gains that people need to get uh, for, for on, on towards their career. So. Um, Digital literacy, we have, we purchased Chromebooks for every student in the class. They use it while they're in class. There's specific instruction in the first part of the class that weaves into the digital literacy component in the second part. We decided on the Chromebooks because they're really, again, with level one, two, and three, it's the simplest platform. People don't need to know Microsoft Office. Our students, some of them have higher skills, but a lot of them have never turned on a computer. They've never used a mouse, they've never touched a keyboard, and then we're getting them into, G they, everybody gets an email address, and we store things on Google Docs so that things can be accessed from any computer in the world. So it's that kind of, uh, that, that's where we're starting. Um, every week we have Thursday workshops. We go on field trips. Field trips we've gone on, we went to the airport, because an airport is like a city. There are hundreds of different jobs, and we had a tour of the facility, and we talked about all the different jobs that were within the airport. Um, we went to a local food co-op because they're in our community, also dozens and dozens of jobs under one roof. They also employ a lot of immigrants and refugees in the stores. We went to our public library and got everybody a library card, and they got a tour of how to use the materials and also how to order things in their native language. Um, we have guest speakers that we say know how to speak ESL. It's actually quite, it's, it's challenging to find people who can talk about what they do, but talk about it in a way that low-level non-English non speakers can understand. Um, another example of kind of what we do in the class that's a little different, I'll give a quick example. We did mock interviews with all the students. So we had an HR director come in and interview um, the students in the class. We started by, she interviewed one of the case managers 
who gave an example of how not to interview you. That the students critiqued her, so they get to be experts. Said that what you did, you did, you looked at your cell phone. You can't look at your cell phone. Um, they gave her tips, things like that. Then she got to redo it. And then each of the students got to have a mock interview, a three to five minute mock interview with our HR director while being videotaped on the Chromebooks. Then they watched the videos of themselves having the mock interviews. And they critiqued themselves that what did they do well? Where's their room for improvement? And I think the thing that we all um, were surprised, but it really helped. Then we, all the students got a chance to redo the job interview. So they now had a chance to watch someone else be interviewed, critique themselves, and do it again. And the improvement between the first time and the second time was huge. And all of this is happening in English. All of this is happening in a way that they're highly engaged, they're motivated, they're motivated by the content. It's important to them to know how to interview. They're motivated by the digital literacy. Everyone wants to know how to use computers. So we do career advising and job development with our case managers. I also really believe that we do a holistic approach. Students come to us, a few of them have had problems with immigration issues. Well, we help them because we have a citizenship department. One student we're working with on um, debt, alleviate, debt, debt reduction for a health care bill. Um, people come to us for um, we need, like clothing vouchers as the season change. New people have in their family. We give support services every two weeks because of our funding, and our funder is definitely a partner and very flexible. We can give people fifty dollars in support services, whether it's transportation assistance or grocery money, and people really appreciate it because they're, like I said, they're in class with us 12, sometimes 13, 14 hours a week when you count case management, and that's not paid time. Um, so we try to help them with the support service money. Um, and we're working with quality employment par employer partners is the last thing I want to say. We're looking to develop relationships with employers in target industries like kitchen and care and local manufacturing, jobs that they might not be able to get on their own right now, but jobs that offer a pathway up and beyond and out of minimum wage should they go back to school or should they be able to stay with the company. So what I love about the program is we can focus on the now job, the survival job, and then we keep working with them. They can take the ESL class up to three times. We can keep working with them just on a case management basis after they're done taking the class to help them with their long-term career plan and also to meet their needs right now in the here and now. So that's ready to work in a nutshell. Great. So thank you both, Alia and Alex, and I'm sure a number of the folks on the phone have questions for you about the kinds of programs you've been working on together and what really made your collaboration tick. But before we go there, we're going to um, advance to uh, Columbus uh, and hear from Guadalupe and Nadia about um, uh, their, their shared work together. Uh, so I think we're going to hear first from Guadalupe, and I'll turn it or, – oh, actually, I think you're both going to kind of tag team this, so I'll turn it over to you both now. Thank you, Stephen. Turning the slides now. Um, thank you so much for really faint, Guadalupe. I wonder if you could speak up a little bit. Okay. Can you hear me now? Barely. Hmm. Let me try. Can you hear? Me? Much better. Perfect. Okay. Um, two of us are together, so we have a headset and us and a handset. Okay. Thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of um, this webinar. And um, we would like to share with you first as well some of the things that our political leadership and community are doing to respond to the backlash um, that has occurred with uh, Syrian refugees and um, the attacks um, around the world. And so the first thing that our city did was our mayor made an announcement um, um, uh, unequivocally, city, the city of Columbus was a city to, that welcomes all, all individuals, including refugees, and that we're a diverse city, and a, um, a city is a diverse city. And then a week after that, our city council um, uh, released a uh, resolution 
And I just want to read just very quickly um, some items on it, not the whole thing at all, but um, it it really talks about what we stand for here in um, central Ohio. And it just says, whereas the city of Columbus is proud to be an ethnically diverse city and home to one quarter of Ohio's foreign population, and whereas more than 100,000 of the region's residents are new Americans, and um, whereas Syrian refugees should be treated with dignity, care, and compassion that every human being deserves. And this really speaks to the leadership of our um, city government. Um, In addition to that, uh, we released the report of the impact of refugees, which we'll be talking about later on in the webinar. And we held a community forum with stakeholders and invited the Partnership for New American Economy. And we discussed um, details and data of what truly the positive impact of refugees in Ohio is. Um, Yesterday, we um, had a um, community forum at a mega church, uh, and it was a a refugee uh, panel discussion with the refugee resettlement agencies for the community to come and uh, not only be educated, but to do a Q&A, and that was very successful. Tomorrow, the city, our office, is doing a Lunch and Learn, um, and it's about dispelling myths and misconceptions um, about refugees. And we're going to have Homeland Security as well as USCIS, one of our refugee resettlement agencies, and a refugee on the panel. And then on um, December 9th, uh, we also have another uh, refugee panel discussion in the community, uh, and all the panelists will be um, refugees. And we're even planning for January. We have something already planned for January 13th. So we want to keep the narrative positive, not only in that the city government supports uh, residents and individuals that live here, no matter where they are from, and especially refugees and um, keep that narrative positive. And so with that, I would, um, we can go on to the next slide. So one of the uh, great examples of collaboration for us was the uh, uh, coming together as all these element organizations in Columbus and bringing City of Columbus as our partner and uh, do a study on uh, impact of refugees on Central Ohio. Uh, the the report uh, produced the results that we expected, and uh, uh, we were very proud to share those results because very often we tell a story of struggle and survival uh, and uh, overcoming uh, difficulties that refugees go through, uh, but it's not the full story. The full story includes uh, what happens after refugees uh, are here. Uh, and and so we wanted to make sure that in addition to all the stories that we have, we also have the data. We know that many refugees uh, impact uh, communities where they live in, in significant, many in significant uh, ways, but now we have a data. And the data uh, shows that uh, VG household spending in Columbus metropolitan area is $35.9 million a year. The total contribution of refugees in Franklin County on an annual basis is $1.6 billion. That refugees are twice more likely to start uh, businesses, that refugees are almost as educated as a general population, that local refugee community supports an estimated 22,000 jobs in Columbus, and uh, and that we have uh, almost 900 refugee-owned businesses that employ almost thousand uh, people and so you don't uh, argue with these numbers <laughs> and and so it was great opportunity for us to collaborate on this project uh, with uh, you know a small a small uh, it started as a very small project and then it grew into a uh, um, two year a two years project uh, getting a lot of data bringing a lot of partners to the table. Okay, and that was Nia Cashman from Us Together, one of the resettlement agencies in Columbus, Ohio. 
Um, moving on to the next slide, um, what we um, what we share is our, our keys to success, and we think, think that they are simply commitment, communication, and collaboration. And so on the first uh, key, commitment, to have a commitment to have a relationship, so that it's very easy for each and every one of us to work in our own silos, especially with city government. We have uh, many things are compartmentalized. So we have internal and external demands, and sometimes it gives us limited time to really be uh, working, uh, work a, for a lot with uh, our external partners, but we know that it is important. And so um, we make it an additional effort to find that balance to work together, and we make that commitment. Nadia? The same goes for nonprofit organizations because we are so focused on serving the community, and it's very easy to fall into the habit of working solely with our national partners and local partners that you know feed into the work that we do. And we sometimes, you know, often <laughs> buried in the woods of the work that we do. Again, with the city, it's easy to be focused on policies and programs that affect organizations, but we know that we have to bring in the organizations in order to do the work effectively. It's easy um, also for um, nonprofit organizations to forget that there is a whole socio-political infrastructure that exists outside of their agencies and um, outside of refugee resettlement, and ultimately, indirectly, and directly, that policy touches the lives of the people that they serve in a great way. And so we, the two of us and, and other organizations that we work with, are committed to um, partnership that um, I, I cannot do this job effectively without the agencies, and likewise the agencies that we work with feel the same way. So together we respond to each other's text message, phone calls, emails, not that I'm encouraging the people to be workaholics, but that means even if the call or text comes in at 10 o'clock, 11 p.m., or 12 a.m. in the morning, is communication. Um, the other organization is really good at communicating and inquiring about projects that we are working on, and we are always, uh, we are simply always uh, directed by what the community um, needs. So a lot of our strategy and policy is based on what the community needs. And um, so reach out to us, even if it's just to write a letter of recommendation or to provide supplemental funding. But we always do it in a way that it's collaborative. So then we, as a nonprofit organization that serves refugees, uh, plan uh, for future or develop the programming or identify the, uh, the needs of refugees that we serve, we reach out to our partners in the city of Columbus and we discuss those issues. We ask for advice uh, and uh, uh, we, we ask which organizations might be a good fit uh, for collaborating. Uh, what are the agencies we need to reach out to uh, to close the gaps in services? Uh, just because CIT, our partners in the city have uh, such an intensive uh, knowledge of our community services and also a very, very significant uh, network that we're utilizing constantly for the benefits of our refugees. And also we, you you know, we, we work a lot with state and county government on refugee settlement program uh, just because they are a lot, uh, and a lot of uh, times they are our funders and uh, for the purposes of advocating for benefits and services for, for our clients. We, I feel very strongly that uh, we bring refugees to a city, and so it's very important to work together with the city to make sure that, uh, you know, there's a, a information flow, the information flows back and forth, and that all of us are aware of who is coming to the city, what are the needs of the population, and how we can address them. And for the city, we're in turn always looking for opportunities to collaborate and to reach a larger and broader the larger and broader community uh, to make a positive impact. And so now we'll go um, on to the third key, which is collaboration, and provide some examples of what we mean. The collaborative programs 
that we've worked on together is the civic engagement citizenship classes. So originally, when um, in 2006, we had created a guide that was called Opening Doors to Our City, and we come, combined that with uh, classes and workshops at um, civic centers, churches, um, schools, and apartment complexes to reach the um, immigrant and refugee community. We wanted to ensure that um, everyone had this guide and knew and understood how to maneuver and access services. We brought guest speakers in from the gas company as well as the library and many other different agencies um, so that they could hear firsthand from um, the actual uh, stakeholder um, agency. Uh, at some point uh, in 2010, Nadia from Us Together shared with us that they were going to be applying for funding to do citizenship training, uh, citizenship classes. And so we determined that this was the perfect time to partner with Us Together and combine the civic orientation classes with the citizenship training. And I'm going to turn it over to Nadia. And we at Us Together, we found that incorporating this training on city services with our uh, classes and preparation for citizenship would add to the civic engagement, and we would uh, provide information to our uh, students on how city government works and uh, to, to encourage uh, and promote civic integration so that um, our clients participate in, in community. And uh, we uh, did a tour we, we offer, through, that, uh, uh, through that collaboration with the City of Columbus. We offered uh, tours of the City Hall. We, uh, we uh, brought our students to uh, City Council meetings. We uh, brought uh, City Council members to our agency to meet with our clients to to promote that communication flowing between uh, city and and city government and the people that we serve in the community. Another partnership we uh, collaborated with, uh, expanding on the citizenship. Um, Training is that we wanted to annually do a graduation for everyone that participated uh, in the citizenship training. And so we combined um, this graduation that you see on the slide with uh, Immigrant Heritage Month. And um, so while on July 1st we were approaching the 4th of July, we took that opportunity to also recognize um, individuals who have not only participated and graduated from the class, but those that had become naturalized citizens. And so this was on City Hall property outside in July, and we had the mayor as well as um, president of city council and other city council members present. And we had about 90 uh, individuals attend that event. And it was a wonderful experience for them to be embraced by the city being so new to um, Columbus. So um, as I, it's it's Nadia coming back on the phone, and uh, again uh, I want to mention the uh, collaboration uh, of City of Columbus with refugee resettlement agencies on uh, impact of refugees in Central Ohio report. Uh, it started with a small idea about two years ago when all three resettlement agencies came together uh, and uh, discussed. What kind of project would uh, we undertake uh, with the funding from uh, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society uh, through the Lincoln Community Project? And one of the uh, ideas was that we can really promote uh, the idea of refugees and uh, the impact refugees on communities they live in through uh, getting the data, through getting the real data. At that time, I mentioned that uh, study to, uh, to Luba at, at one of our uh, meetings, and, and she, she really embraced this idea, and she took it to city council. She uh, brought another partner from the state. We, uh, we talked to local foundations. We brought in additional funding. So from about five to 6,000 funding, this report uh, at the end costs around 60, over 60,000. But, uh, you know, we were able to uh, gather uh, real data that now we promote through, through various events. 
this is Guadalupe again, and the report has uh, 14 stories of refugees from uh, several continents. And so um, I feel like with us working in this flow, and, and um, not to get so spiritual, but timing is um, is essence here by releasing this report. Now we have a tool, and so we plan to do um, several more forums and then take it to community um, area agencies, and we have civic agencies and area um, commissions, and we are going to start to discuss this report in each and every neighborhood for 2016. So with that, uh, these are um, some of the that we've worked on or projects we've worked on together, uh, Susan, and uh, we continue to look for and do work on other projects as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Guadalupe and Nadia, for sharing your incredible work together in Columbus. Um, really, it's fantastic to hear from two sets of very unique um, and inspiring city uh, CBO collaborations. And I'm sure any of you on the phone have questions for our speakers or perhaps would like to get some advice related to your own context. So I encourage you, I would urge you to chat in your questions and comments, and I will um, share those uh, with, the, with the rest of the group. So please don't be shy. This is your opportunity uh, to share a little bit. Um, with our, our audience. We've already got one question about, about the report. Um, Guadalupe, is it available online? I was wondering if there might be a PDF available that we could send out with our flip materials to the call. Um, oh, hi. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, we, um, we released it last Thursday, and we are uh, just doing a few tweaks. It is uh, available online, and I'll be happy to send the PDF to you. Um, just to please note, again, I'm, I am going to make just a few more edits in the last week, and um, just to uh, for for our print ready. So yes, we do have it available, and we're happy to send it. Um, if you don't mind, if we send it within a week, that'd be even better. Okay, that sounds. Is that, that okay? Sounds great. Okay. Yes. So another question for, for both of the cities, um, that is, you know, we've got some align along a broad spectrum in terms of how closely they've been able to work with their local government. Um, for those who might just be getting started or just trying to figure out um, who the right person might be to connect to, what's your advice? How should people get started if they're really motivated to – develop these kinds of collaborations with their local government, um, where should they begin? And Susan, um, that was one section that I, I wanted to uh, cover in my section, but I, I was wanted to be sensitive of time. So if I may begin and then uh, turn it over to Seattle. Um, what's really important um, that it's, it's a cliche, but I feel that it's a very true cliche. People don't care what you know until they know you care. And so it's important also to look at our city and county uh, government officials. As, um, also, they, are, they do hold an office, but they are there to hear from constituents. And so I think it's really important to um, schedule, call, uh, call the uh, scheduler and just schedule a meeting for coffee or to come to their office. But I also I also think it's important for everyone to do their research on what particular issues um, or causes that a uh, political um, leader is very focused on because then you can tie in how that um, can serve the immigrant refugee population as well. Um, I think it's important to also, just like um, we are asked to attend events for organizations, I think it's important for organizations to attend events that <coughs> city council or the mayor or county commissioners hold because that helps like any relationship that helps to build um, relationship when you show that you have skin in the game and what they're interested at all also street I, I completely agree with Guadalupe I mean I think uh, a lot of it has to do with um, getting, getting the stories out there to to our electeds right I mean we've had great success with, with bringing folks in, telling their stories in a way that's very heartfelt and unscripted, and 
the best responses we've had from our electeds is when those stories come from the heart. So, so once you've established a relationship with, with your elected or your policymaker, I would follow up with taking a constituent or a couple of folks who can speak to the particular issues you're concerned about to meet with them as well. That's a really good point that you made because that is exactly what we hear every time uh, there's a meeting is can you bring some people back that so we can talk to them. So that's that's outstanding. Thanks for mentioning that too. So the, the questions are going wild now. This is great. We have a very very energized audience. So here's we're going to try to keep the answers somewhat concise so we can get to uh, quite a few of these questions. So the this question I flagged for. Um, for uh, Alia and for Guadalupe is around policy issues. You know, what do you say are the top two to three policy issues you'd prior prioritize in working with the refugee community? I don't have to all four speakers. I should, it's, policy isn't just the city, it's CBOs too, so. This is Alia, and I think, I think it's really dependent on the, the city and the issues that are, of, uh, of importance to the communities, right? I mean, for us, the things we've been, the clear thread has, uh, of concern has been around education. Education is a big deal. Education and youth violence. And so those are two areas that we've been really trying to engage our communities on. And the other one is housing. Uh, so it's becoming really expensive. People are getting pushed out of Seattle. They can't afford to live here. In fact, most of our refugee, new arrival refugees, they come in, they're here for six months, and they have to move out because they can't live here anymore. So those are the, those are the two top issues that we've been very busy on. In Columbus. Um, the uh, the the first priority was language access access to services and so a lot of attention and policy and directives from the mayor were focused in health and safety. Um, now we are moving more toward um, uh, I'm sorry education and uh, and also bullying as we're and and actually a big uh, focus for us it's in the area of health since 2005. I've, um, we can do this, um, and is uh, infant mortality. So that is a very big um, F, and so, um, so that's where we're focused on in um, Columbus. Right. Um, Alex, we have a question for you about the ESL curriculum. Can you share a little bit about how that contextual ESL curriculum was developed and to what extent um, if you tapped into the IBEST program, which Washington State's so known for? Sure. So it's, we're, our partners are the two of Seattle's community colleges. Uh, and so we use their, their standards and we develop a, a curriculum outline. The curriculum outline has a theme. The theme is, has generally been something like uh, my life, my career. And then they have weekly topics. The talks are things like um, your, your dream job, interviewing, your career, what's next. And then there are just, because we partner closely with the community colleges, it's not really for us or the city tell them um, what to, to what, what to teach. We also are working with a, a national expert, a woman named Haida Wrigley. She's from Literacy Work International, um, and so she works with the instructors. And so, Haida, we, we, we come up with the topics for each week. Obviously, then the instructors say, this is what I want to do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then Haida weaves in best practices. So, and we have weekly phone calls with Haida around what went on, how did, how did it go. And actually, it was Haida that pushed the teachers after we videotaped the students for their mock interviews. And, and critique the Haida said you should let, have a chance to do it again. And the teachers said, well, we don't really have time for that. And said you should let them have a chance to do it again. And realize like that, that do and then critique and redo is such an important part of how people learn, adults, kids, whatever. If it's, if it's meaningful, you make time for it. So the curriculum is a work in progress. It's really to the standards that are statewide. It's geared. We have presenters come in from IBEST at the colleges, um, and IBEST actually there are few bridges to IBEST, 
prims. So for like if you need to be a level five to take the IVEST, a bridge program might help students in level four, but we don't have any level four. So we're, what we're do, working with now are people who are in level three, and we hope that they could be a four within like the next six months. So they are aware of IBEST. We have presenters. Actually, this in the winter, we're going to take a field trip to one of the community colleges um, and that has the most IBEST programs on site. They have like a culinary program, a nursing program, an aeronautics program, a manufacturing program, a welding program. So with one trip, we can see all of these different future career pathways. So we try to be hands-on. And that, at the end of the winter quarter, we will have a a curriculum that's a, a project for it, at least for one quarter for levels one, two class and a level three class. And I'd like and to Alex, just add that one of the reasons we brought Hyde in as a consultant is because we really wanted to do better. We're not doing well enough with our existing ways of teaching English and preparing people for jobs. And Haida ha has a tremendous wealth of knowledge from having designed curriculums, and she's learned what works. And she's really thinking outside the box in, in, in terms of the curriculum. She put that. The natural question then for folks on the phone is, is this curriculum available? Is it something that other communities can tap into? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. That's right. It will be. We, we're still, as, as Alex said, it's still a work in process, mm -hmm. and we have we want to test it with a couple more, more cohorts uh, through the winter quarter. So I'm hoping in about eight twelve months we should be able to share it with people. But keep in mind that what we it's not just a standalone ESL class. So mm -hmm. it's, it would be a good curriculum, but it's it's ESL plus employment case management and connections to employers. So but the ESL curriculum will be good. <laughs> All right, thank you both. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the report that Columbus just did on, on refugee impacts. We're getting quite a few questions about that, and so Nadia, maybe we can start with you. Um, give us a sense of how long it took to put the report together. Uh, the infographic, um, is there, you know, is there, can you tell us a little bit more about who compiled the information for the infographic, if that is available at a national level? I Kind of not, but wanted to see if you've anything. Um, and then also we have a question about if your statistics include um, asylees or if they're strictly uh, refugees. Okay, uh, these, these, the, this is the data uh, specifically for refugee uh, populations. And the, the, idea, uh, uh, the idea came to us about two years ago, but from from the time that we uh, thought about that and brainstormed to the point when we actually started on report, it took us about a year to figure out the final. It's not hard to hear you, Nadia. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you sound very far away. Can you hear now? Much better. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So uh, the idea uh, uh, came to us about two years ago, and so it took us about a year to figure out partnerships and look at other existing reports. Uh, uh, two years prior to that, uh, Refugee Collaborative did uh, uh, study on uh, refugee impact in Cleveland and look at partners and funding, and so uh, it took us about a year. Year. And then for the last 12 months, we uh, worked together with uh, the um, with partner from uh, that, that did research, uh, with our with, with designer, with the photographer, with the uh, storytelling uh, person who would put together the stories, with uh, uh, the data that we had together. Because one of the uh, uh, barriers that we identified pretty soon into the uh, study is that we actually did not have a lot of data because, I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure that all of us would love to have funding and staff time to follow our refugees after a year, after two, like where are they now? That would be perfect, but you know we we don't do that, and so you know we we had all the data from all the refugee settlement agencies uh, for the first year, so the first 
to implement maybe the the the, the, the second employment, but we really didn't fall refugees. For for years, uh, and so we had to come up with the uh, with the sample size in the community. All three refugee uh, serving organizations had to uh, do household surveys that we divided among ourselves. We did uh, more than hundred uh, surveys of uh, refugee households. We did uh, focus groups. We did uh, we did interviews with the key, uh, key holders in the community. And so uh, from from starting actually gathering the the, the data. From uh, bringing in the research partner at, uh, at the table to the uh, issuing uh, the report and printing our first report, it took us about a year. Um, and so it was exactly 359 people that had to be surveyed based on the population, uh, families that had to be surveyed. And um, I believe one question is it. About the infographics and yeah, um, you put that together. Okay. Is there is that kind of so unique? We specifically we okay. We specifically used a photographer that's also a refugee that does uh, photography and uh, documentaries. Are um, everyone the story writer and um, also the uh, graphic designer? All local small businesses, so local um, immigrant uh, business businesses as well. We wanted to make sure that we. Um, we, so that we used our, you know, within the community, we supported the community we were, we were working with. But also um, the stories, um, we wanted to do a report for the 20 years of history um, during refugee resettlement, but that was harder once we found out what data we were trying to do. So the stories being with Cuban refugees that have been here for 20 30 years actually, and uh, one of them is even a city councilwoman uh, for a local city in Central High. So we um, we went back in, in terms of our stories. So we do cover an asylee um, family as well. So the stories tell what we could not provide in the data, but data is um, it's raw data of our community. Great, thank you, and thank you uh, to all of our speakers uh, for um, sharing such rich information with all of us. We're sorry that we weren't able to get to everybody's questions today, but our speaker generously shared their contact information. So uh, if you do have a, a pressing question, um, please do feel free to reach out to our speakers, and I'm sure they'd be happy uh, to assist you. So as all you Oh, I'm go ahead. Yes. I just want to say, at, in the report, we do have bios and pictures um, where we could of the service providers. So the photographer's information is there, the uh, designer, the graphic designer, as well as the the writer. So, um, is, in terms of if you wanted to share that information, it's in the report. We're happy to share it. Okay. Thank you. We'll make sure to do that. Uh, and if you have a question that you'd like to. Um, Ask speakers that we weren't able to get to today, uh, please um, feel free to reach out. And um, we're going to just spend the, next, uh, the last few minutes of the webinar um, making aware of some other resources that may be of interest to you. Uh, first of all, we're going to be having a deeper dive conversation on fr Friday, December 18th at 1 o'clock Eastern. Uh, this is a conference call for folks who are on the webinar who would really like to um, speak with some of our um, um, speakers and with Welcoming America in greater depth uh, in a uh, kind of more personalized, uh, more intimate um, structure. So um, if, you're, if this is a, a topic that is really of deep interest to you, if maybe you have some examples from your own work that you would like to share or you'd like to get some advice on, we would welcome you to participate in the Deeper Dive uh, conference call. Um, to do that, to sign up, you just need to send Anna an email um, at, at this email address uh, at welcomingamerica.org, and you know, let us know um, your name, organization, what city you're working from, and what you'd most like to discuss because it helps help us design a, a call that helps meet your needs. So again, it's getting pretty close to the holidays. Um, but if you are free on December 18th and would be, like to continue the conversation, we do hope you'll join us. 
wanted to make sure you all knew of an exciting opportunity for the White House. Uh, for these to join the White House's Building Welcoming Communities campaign. Um, many cities like Seattle and Columbus have signed on uh, to, to showcase um, their uh, interest in welcoming uh, immigrants and refugees. And through this um, campaign, they're able to access quite a bit of uh, technical assistance um, from federal agencies as well as from national organizations uh, and to get um, recognition for the great work that they are doing. Um, to, to participate in this campaign, uh, uh, it, it's really the city government that has to sign on, so it's, it's not a campaign um, for nonprofits, it's, it's, but if your city, um, your mayor or um, uh, city manager is really interested in, um, in welcoming uh, has not yet joined, we'd really uh, encourage them to, to learn more about it. And um, if, you, if you think this might be of interest or, or you're a city on the phone call today and, and would like to follow up, you can email Cynthia at welcomeamerica.org and she'd be happy to answer any questions about the campaign and how to get started. Um, uh, I did want to mention our upcoming webinar. Uh, I'm so thrilled that my home state of Colorado uh, has done a longitudinal study of refugee integration and welcome and um, is getting ready to release those um, study results. And so um, this is something for us all to look forward to uh, after the new year. Uh, I hope you'll join us for our next webinar to learn more about, about the study, the methodology, and we're learning about how refugees refugees are really faring over the long term. Um, so join us on Tuesday, January 12th um, at 30 Eastern. For now, just save the date. We'll be sending out a blast on how to register uh, soon, uh, but wanted to make sure you got this date on your calendar now. We also have a new resource on our website. Uh, if you go to um, welcomingrefugees.org, um, you can uh, view this uh, to video. Uh, the video is designed to be a tool to help organizations uh, train and uh, inspire uh, volunteers who work in their organizations. Uh, it's also meant to be a tool um, to help volunteers think about how they can share their positive experiences of helping refugees more broadly across their social network. Uh, so please um, check it out on welcomingrefugees.org. Um, on welcomingrefugees.org, you'll see an, a number of other great tools. Uh, the community planning tool, which we released a few months back, um, really outlines uh, a community planning process that um, Boise has made famous, but other, other um, cities and um, uh, refugee agencies are continuing to look at as they um, think about how to deepen their collaboration and go about a, a, a comprehensive approach for um, welcoming refugees. Uh, all of our webinars, including this one, um, are, all of those webinars are recorded and they're available um, for you to listen to on the website. And that just about wraps us up for today's um, webinar. We want to thank all of you for joining us. We want to thank our um, wonderful speakers for all of their work and for um, sharing their expertise with us today. And we uh, wish you a, a, a great uh, end of the year and look forward to um, checking back in with many of you in 2016. Uh, so that, uh, thanks again, and um, have a great day.